country and speaking, often people who are in the situation I was in tell me their story. The amazing thing is every story is different because the rate of loss and what is lost is all, is all different. But the constant is that if we love that person, we want to hold them to what they were, what we knew them to be. This is terribly frustrating for the person, both the caregiver and the one receiving the care. I was always playing catch up, but when people ask me for advice, I don't really have any advice on how to go about it, except watch your expectations. Accept them for where they are. They can't perform much as they might want to. They can't perform at the stage they were before. Sometimes I hear people s express the, the, the hope, the desire, the right to live happily ever after. And I guess it depends on how you define happy. If you mean trouble free, then this is really the ultimate of, of uh, fantasy because we live in a fallen world. That's really the reason I didn't have a problem, which many people have, of asking why. I, I don't fault people who ask God why, because we live in a fallen world. And if we Christians were exempt from disease, from heartache, from tragedy, from Alzheimer's, if we were exempt from it, just by being Christian, then everybody would be a Christian. I think the commitment in a marriage is, if it's a Christian marriage, the, the promise is to God in the presence of these people. And oh yes, it's toward this person, but it's to God. And you know God hates divorce, it says in Scripture. And he says, he who makes a vow and does not keep it, that God abhors such a person, that's pretty scary kind of talk. So can you stop on the way? Of course. And it doesn't happen when each puts the other's interests ahead of his own or her own interests. You say, can I do that if I don't love? Sure, you can make the choice. It's not much fun. You know, it's not much fun, but it's possible. And if I love God enough, that's what I'll do. I'll put the interest of the other person first. If both do that, I can almost guarantee that the affection and the love is going to return and blossom. If one or the other refuses to move over to that way of life, there's that's what division is about. So is there hope after divorce? Indeed. Indeed. Our God is the God of a second chance. And especially if a person doesn't become bitter and forever be incriminating against the other person uh, and learns through the experience, then the next time around can be much better. I have read the common assertion that uh, half of our marriages end in divorce. I have also read studies that say these are not discriminatory because they lump together second and third divorces with the first divorce and probably no more than a third and the American populace uh, have been divorced. But because some are divorced repeatedly, in fact, too many, it comes out to 50%. But still, that means at least a third of the people are in misery and they say that, they say that evangelicals are, have similar statistics. And my own experience in the last 25 years is that the number of, of pastors who have failed and Divorced has uh, exponentially increased. So, 
at the same time, those who are not divorced, officially, legally, but who live in separate bedrooms, no, not necessarily in separate bedrooms, with alienation of spirit, with emotional divorce. What proportion of those who are not part of the divorce statistics yet are part of this agony? Is there any hope? Yes, there's hope, but only if both are willing to go over into God's territory and live for the welfare of the other. Perhaps you've heard of the phrase, the seven-year itch used to be that marriages uh, ended after seven years was the peak divorce rate. Well, today, the seven-year itch occurs between year three and four in married couples' lives. Why does that happen? Well, I think what happens is our differences can become uh, obstacles to developing a relationship. I think a lot of couples are tossing the towel in just because they have things about one another that aggravate them. And they get focused on those points of contention. They get their eyes um, narrowly focused on the negative and forget the positive. They forget what attracted them to the other person in the first place. You know, if your spouse is different than you, it's probably the reason why you married them in the first place. Don't allow your differences to become a magnet that pushes you apart. Instead, turn those magnets around and allow those differences to bring you back together again and make Jesus Christ the Lord and Master of your family. It's my personal belief that it's only when a man and a woman end up receiving their spouse as God's provision for their aloneness needs that they can ultimately receive the gift of their spouse as it was intended from God a personal handmade gift by Him just for you. Perhaps you're married to someone who um, refuses to change. You're willing to place God at the center of your life, but your spouse isn't. Is that a hopeless situation? I don't think it is. Let me encourage you in your own marriage relationship for you to do what you can do which is ask God to change your heart, your life. Allow Jesus Christ to live in and through you. Don't allow your spouse's refusal to change, refusal to love, to turn your life into a sour, embittered, grieving, hardened heart. Instead, use that pain to turn toward God. I personally believe that one of the things God uses in our lives over and over and over again is pain to turn us toward Him. Perhaps at this moment, He is reaching out to you in your pain, the pain that you're experiencing in your marriage, and He wants to use that pain to invite you into a relationship with Him. Why not take Him at His word and begin to do what you can do, which is change your own heart and your own attitude and grow as a follower of Jesus Christ. Many have wondered, can God bless a second marriage? Just because we're remarried, can we experience uh, the blessings of Almighty God? And you know what? Absolutely. The story of the Bible is that God has always taken broken people, people who've made mistakes, people who've made errors, people who have fouled up their lives, and God, Almighty God, the creator of the universe, steps into their lives and He picks up the broken pieces, and he delights in using a powerful word called grace. He uses grace to begin to call them out of their selfishness and give them hope. Sociologists have written over the past decade and have described our generation as a culture of divorce. I personally believe one of the biggest problems in our country is that we have allowed the D word, divorce, to replace the C word, commitment. My challenge to you is, if you have ever used the D word in your marriage, to promise 
and covenant together as a couple that you will never ever allow those words, the D word, to cross your lips. And if your children have heard you mention the D word, would you go to them and apologize? Would you let them know that you're sorry that word has ever been uttered in your household and then tell them that the D word is going to be replaced by the C word, commitment. And then find ways to begin to affirm one another by expressing your commitment to one another. I personally think it's time for all of us who are married to replace the D word with the C word.